welcome to the service to Seven Day Adventist Church. Would you please pray with me? Gracious Father, Lord, again, we're so thankful to be able to come into your house this morning to hear from on high. Father, we pray that you will bless us each one, fill us with your spirit. Please baptize us afresh with your spirit. Wash us, Lord, cleanse us in the precious blood of Jesus. Hide us behind the cross, Lord, and may you get all the glory, all the praise. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, we do pray. Amen. The title of this message probably says a lot about me. <laughs> um, it is signed, sealed, delivered. Now, some folks out there would probably recognize that title of a song that was, oh, it was written by a guy by the name of Stevie Wonder. I don't know if you're familiar with that name. Um, written in 1969 and released in 1970. Um, signed, sealed, delivered. I'm going to um, plagiarize that, I guess you, you could say. But anyway, this message today to me is probably um, one of the most important messages I, just, I think that I have ever delivered. So I'm asking for your prayers. If you open your Bibles to the second chapter of Thessalonians, Thessalonians chapter 2. And we're going to start reading in verse 1. Thessalonians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul writes to the Thessalonians, Now we beseech thee, we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of the Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us. As that day, as that the day of of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, who, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he is God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Um, would you please now turn to the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel and the 11th chapter, Daniel chapter 11. I would like to read whole chapter, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm going to go to the last five verses of Daniel chapter 11. Verse 40, and at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and, pa and shall, pa overpass, shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land, and many countries shall be overthrown. But these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and of silver, and over all the precious things of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. 
but tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Yet he shall come to his end, and none shall help him. We have been admonished by the servant of the Lord to pay a special attention to the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. You could call one the hand and the other one the glove. Um, we have been especially asked to pay special attention to the 11th chapter of the book of Daniel. And I would like to share with you something that um, comes from the spirit of prophecy. And it is quotes that um, I think you will find extremely interesting and important at this time in their, this earth's history. It says here, the prophecies of the 11th of Daniel have almost reached their final fulfillment. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecy of the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The judgments of God are in the land. The wars and rumors of wars, the destruction by fire and flood, say clearly that the time of trouble, which is to increase until the end, is very near at hand. We have no time to lose. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. The prophecies of the 11th of Daniel have also excuse me, have almost reached their final fulfillment. And the last one gives a little bit more detail. We have no time to lose. Troublous times are before us. The world is stirred with the spirit of war. Soon the scenes of trouble spoken of in the prophecies will take place. The prophecy in the 11th chapter of Daniel has nearly reached its complete fulfillment. Much of the history that has taken place in fulfillment of this prophecy will be repeated. In the 30th verse, a power is spoken of that shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And arms shall stand on his, on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice. And they shall place the abomination that make, maketh desolate. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Scenes similar to those described in these words will take place we see evidence that Satan is fast obtaining the control of human minds who have not the fear of God before him, before them. Let all read and understand the prophecies of this book, for we are now entering upon the time of trouble spoken of. This is extremely important. Um, if you are familiar with the writings of Ellen White, you'll know that she has not spoken on um, the 11th chapter of Daniel in detail, uh, she's never even quoted the last five verses of Daniel. What you just heard was her quoting verses 30 through 36. And now, um, in order to understand the importance of this, um, we need to put things in context. You know, I got to tell you a little bit about our church history. It was an individual by the name of Uriah Smith that wrote a wonderful book. And the book was called um, The Daniel and the Revelations. Ellen White endorsed that book. But I have to say this, no book written by a human being is perfect. And in that book, Uriah Smith uh, commented on the king of the north 
as Turkey. I don't know if some of you that are older would know that. Um, the comment that he made caused the husband of Ellen White to become flabbergasted. For the longest time, it was believed by the pioneers that the king of the north was the papacy and not Turkey. In 1870, because Turkey was so prominent in the news at that time, Uriah Smith changed from it being the papacy to being Turkey. James Smith wrote an article in 1877 and then again in 1878 and criticized Uriah Smith's interpretation of that particular portion of Daniel. He was lovingly rebuked by his wife to cease and desist from criticizing Brother Smith about this. And the reason she did that was because this issue was not salvitic. It had nothing to do with salvation. And being that she was married to James White, had she made comment in her writings specifically about the chapters or verses that we're talking about, well, she would have been accused of nepotism. So she wisely spoke about the last five verses of Daniel chapter 11, but she did not mention them in her writings at all. And I think that was a wise thing for her to do. Uh, she knew that at some point in time, individuals such as yourself would study these things out and understand exactly what she had done. Uh, the book, Great Controversy, if you have read that book, you'll see that the format of that book follows chronologically the events starting from the destruction of Jerusalem all the way to the Second Coming. Um, so she really had a lot to say about Daniel chapter 11, verses 40 through 45. However, she explained or described what was taking place in those verses, but she did not mention them by name or by verse. So if you start with um, what she did write about Daniel chapter 12, when Michael stood up, let's look at that real quick if we could, because what we're going to have to do is kind of work backwards to see Daniel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contentment. If you look at what Daniel is saying here, it, it's simply the same thing that you find Christ saying in Matthew chapter 24. There would come a time of trouble such as there has never been since a nation was on the earth. Uh, you find this same thing here in the Bible. God uses what's called recapitulation, or uh, the process of expanding and enlarging. For instance, in Daniel chapter 2, you see four kingdoms that would arise upon the earth. In Daniel chapter 7, you see a re-emphasis of those four kingdoms However, instead of using metals, God uses beasts. Uh, and he gives more information in Daniel chapter 7 than what we have in Daniel chapter 2. He then turns and does the same thing with Daniel chapter 8. He gives more information, and the scene changes a little bit, and uh, you get another topic that is introduced, the cleansing of the sanctuary. So then when we get to Daniel chapter 11, you get probably the most detailed you know, that you find that is reiterating the things that you find in Daniel chapter 2, chapter 7, and chapter 8. And so when you understand what the prophet is doing, um, it is simply solidifying what he has already done and enlarging or explaining or expanding upon those things. So here in Daniel chapter 12, when it speaks of the time of trouble that is going to come upon the earth, it is a re-emphasis 
if we go back to the 11th chapter of Daniel, in the 40th verse, you'll notice a phrase that is very familiar to us. It says, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. That word push in Hebrew is a very interesting word. Um, when we think of a push, we think of a little, usually a little shove. But the word there in Hebrew uh, gives us more than just a little push. It, it actually means to like gourd or to thrust. So this is probably not the best word to, that could have been used, but anyway. Um, so it says here that at the time of the end, the time of the end, we all know to be the year 1798. I know there's not a lot of people in here, but I, I, I like participation. <laughs> you could speak uh, back to me. I'm, I'm, I'm good with that. So at 1798, the Bible calls it the time of the end. So that puts us in a place where we know where these verses are speaking of historically. Verses 30 through 36 were those verses that she mentioned were already fulfilled in her day. And those verses pertained to the papacy. And, excuse me, to, uh, yeah, to the papacy. Um, and with the destruction of the papacy, it came in the year 1798. So as far as Bible study goes, it puts us in Revelation chapter 13. Okay, It's mentioned in 42 months or three and a half years. Uh, the Bible mentions this time period several different ways. A time, times, and the dividing of times, Daniel chapter 7. Um, again, as I said, 42 months, three and a half years, uh, the time of the end. So here we are now, knowing exactly where we are in time. So one of the most important things for us to understand, and why I'm bringing this to us today, is because of what's actually in verse 45. What God is doing, I believe here, is he is pulling the mask off of the enemy of souls. I want to read a couple of scriptures, but I want to read verse 45 again, the first part of it and then read a couple other scriptures so we can get the gist of what the enemy's goal is. It says here in verse 45, And he, speaking of the, the king of the north, shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas in the glorious holy mountain. Now, if you go back to the scripture that we initially read, remember in 2 Chronicles chapter 2, 2 Chronicles chapter 2 and verse 3 and 4. It says here, Let no man deceive you by any means, that they shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Who does what? Verse 4, Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he is God does what? sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you see the similarity between what he's doing in verse 45 of Daniel 11 and this verse here? Also, if you go to Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 14, Isaiah chapter 14 and beginning in verse 12, Scripture says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning, how art thou cut down to the ground, which did weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will what? I will sit up also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Um, while we're in the Old Testament, go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28, starting in verse 1. Under the personification of the king of Tyre's, the word of the Lord came again unto me, saying, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyre's, Thus saith the Lord God, because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God, I sit in the seat 
of God in the midst of the seas. Yet thou art a man and not God, though thou sit thy mind, thy heart, as the heart of God. So the common factor that we've seen in all of those verses was this power, this entity, wants to sit in the place of God. So remember that we're dealing now with Daniel chapter 11, the last verses that were yet to be fulfilled. Those things that were written before time, starting in verse 2 uh, with, with Persia and then Greece and then going on down to pagan Rome and then switching to papal Rome. Now we're dealing with, remember, the king of the north. Uh, the scripture says that the king of the south would push against him and he would turn as a whirlwind and go against the king of the south. Uh, we know from studying the scriptures that the king of the south was simply atheism. You know, and we could say atheism or atheism communism. And this is why uh, this is so important to us today because there was this contention between these powers, which are both empirical powers. Both of them want to rule. Atheism wanted to rule. Of course, the papacy also wanted to rule. The importance of this to us is so critical because, again, what this entity which is the little horn of Daniel 7, the little horn of Daniel 8, the son of perdition of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the sea beast of Revelations chapter 13, um, the whore of Babylon of Revelations chapter 17. All of these terms are synonymous, speaking of that same power that Daniel speaks of in the last five verses of chapter 11 as the king of the north. So... What we have here is this contention. I looked for a book that I had uh, for a long time. And again, last night, I couldn't find it. Uh, I'm sure that some of you may have heard of this book. It was written by a man by the name of Malachi Martin. It was called The Keys of This Blood. In that book, he makes a statement that there was a no-holds-barred competition for three, between three competitors. Those competitors were the Soviet Union, the United States, and the Vatican, or the papacy. Now, we know from prophecy that that competition was going to be not so much just one, that Russia wasn't going to be really a contender in the end with this, but that there would be a, a union between what the Bible calls the false prophet, or we call apostate Protestantism, reaching across the abyss and clasping the hands of the Roman powers. So long before Malachi Martin wrote that book, we already knew who was going to win that competition. He made it very clear that there could only be one winner, and in his mind, it was going to be, of course, the papacy. So again, here we have this information that has been given to us in the Bible about the king of the north. Um, in 1798, a little history, Napoleon sent his general, Alexander Berthier, into Rome, and he arrested the pope. He exiled him back into France, where he died in, in uh, captivity. So when you look at what the prophet was saying about those chapters, those verses in Daniel being repeated, uh, some, of the, some of the top prophecies in the Bible, like in Matthew, has a dual fulfillment. You know, they dealt with the destruction of Jerusalem as well as the end of the world. But that's not what she's saying here in these verses in Daniel. She is saying not that the verses will be repeated, but that the history of those verses would be repeated. And the reason she's saying that is because that beast power, that little horn power, received a deadly wound. And for some time after its dominance for 1,260, that's another way that, that 42 months or the times, time, uh, times and a half a times uh, or three and a half years is mentioned. I couldn't remember that. 1,260 years of papal supremacy is called. She knew that once that came to an end, that this power, according to Revelation 13, the Bible says that deadly wound would be healed. In other words, this king of the north would come off of its forced hiatus, and would again begin to have the power that it once had. When you study Revelations 13 carefully, 
you find another beast coming up in verse 11. And it seems as if the only reason that beast comes up in verse 11 is to facilitate the first beast coming up out of the sea, which is, again, the papacy or the king of the north, in regaining power. That beast that comes up in verse 11, we know to be the United States of America. And it says that he would cause all, this second beast, to worship that first beast who had the deadly wound that was healed. Um, rich and bond, free and poor, everyone would be having to worship this first beast. He would cause those to do what? To receive a mark in their forehead or in their right hand. So that second beast, basically the United States, is simply uh, almost seems to come into existence to help this first beast regain its prominence. So the reason why this is so important to us, it has really never been about uh, what we hear today, the right and the left. You know, you're hearing so much, and it's, it's, it's coming to our church as well as to all other churches. The enemy has tried to infiltrate this church in many different ways and with many different topics. But one of the ways that he has found success as of late is through individuals aligning themselves with that spirit of war, that spirit of strife, that spirit of contention that we had been warned against um, allowing to come into our, our midst. Individuals that have taken their political positions and have placed so much stock in their political leaders to the point where um, they have not truly been able to see that the enemy's goal is to simply be able to plant his tabernacle between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Now, we know that the king of the south in Daniel chapter 11, we're talking spiritually. We're not talking literally, are we? The king of the south, that being atheism, we're talking simply spiritual. And the king of the north, we're talking spiritual Babylon, spiritual, uh, um, what is it? beast, spiritual, the little horn, that is no longer simply a local incident. Now we're talking about on a global scale. We understand? On a global scale. So we're not just talking about this individual wanting to plant their tabernacles. When you hear that word seas, it's a poetic term for um, the Mediterranean. You'll see that same thing that was in uh, Ezekiel chapter 28, verse 1, seas. And of course, that glorious mountain or the glorious land, what would that be spiritually? The church, exactly. So you see here what the enemy's goal is to do is to get himself within the midst of God's people, God's remnant church, his last day people. And unfortunately, because we have allowed ourselves to get put so much stock in the right and the left, not realizing that it's never been about the right, it's never been about the left, it's been about the south and the north. This little horn power, this king of the north, wants to do exactly what God has done. But the Bible says that something would happen that would cause him angst, that tidings from the east and from the north would cause him some discomfort. And so... I want you to understand here, if you look in Revelations chapter 7, and let's take a look at uh, what those tidings might have been, might be. Revelations chapter 7, verse 2. The scripture says here, starting in verse 1, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from where? From the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of God in their foreheads. We know that the seal of God is found in his law. The seal of God, the Bible says, um, 
has to do with God's position, his, his name, his position, and his area of authority, which we all know we find in the fourth commandment. So this here is a message about the fourth commandment. If you go over to Revelation chapter 14 now, you will also see, starting in verse 7, uh, excuse me, 6, and I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, kindred, and tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. This is basically a almost verbatim a quote of the fourth commandment. So this horn power, this little king, this king of the north, remember the Bible says a message or a tiding came from the east that caused him to uh, turn with fury upon the people of God. Uh, let's look at another scripture about the north. Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1. Jeremiah chapter 1, and we'll start in verse 16. Well, actually, verse 13. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto me the second time, saying, What seest thou? And I said, I see a seeding pot, and the face thereof is towards the where? Are you there? Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 13. Towards the north. Remember, the message that calls this king of the north to have issues came from the east, and it came from the north. It says in verse 14, Then the Lord said unto me, Out of the north an evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof around about, and against all the cities of Judah. Verse 16, And I will, pull, I will utterly... I will utter my judgments against them, touching all their wickedness who have forsaken me and have burnt incense unto other gods and worshipped the works of their own hands. So the tidings that came from the east, a message of God's true Sabbath, his holy Sabbath, and then the message that came from the north, the message of judgment. If you continue reading in Revelation chapter 14, the second angel joins the first angel preaching the everlasting gospel. The context changes. The context changes from the judgment of God that has come to Babylon has fallen, has fallen. Um, the last message by the last angel is definitely a message of judgment, a message of warning. It says, if anyone worship the beast or his image or receive his mark, either in his forehead or in his right hand, the same shall drink of, drink of the wine of the wrath of God. It's, a, it's one of the most severe warnings in all of the Bible. So what is it that causes this king of the north, the papacy, to turn with fury against the people of God? God's people will be blessed with a power that we have yet to have, the latter reign. God's people will receive from that refreshing from on high that will cause us to shut off our TVs, turn all of our attentions away from all of the distractions, and be about our Father's business. We will go forward preaching the three angels' message, the everlasting gospel. We will go forward warning the world, Babylon has fallen. Come out of her, God says. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. So these messages, as they, as they grow to a swell, to a loud cry, it will make the enemies of God furious. Now we're back to the uh, Daniel chapter 11, verse 45. Also, the parallelism of Daniel chapter 12, where the Bible talks about this time of trouble that will come upon God's people. And what brings this time of trouble upon God's people is that we will finally get it together. We will stop the bickering. We will stop the arguing. We will stop the right and the left things that have come in, we become united. Now remember, while all of this is happening, something called the shaking is taking place. All that can be shook out will be shook out. 
all that is not rooted firmly in the Lord Jesus Christ will ultimately be shook out. And God will have a people that will be about his business and that will go forward preaching with power like never before. The three angels' messages of Revelation chapter 14. I always like to say there's really only one message. Remember, that first angel appears in the midst of heaven having the everlasting gospel to preach to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Revelation 14 is simply a fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus spoke in Matthew chapter 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached into all the world to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Revelation 14 is the fulfillment of that. It will go forward with such power and to conviction it cannot be stopped. It will not be stopped. Regardless of what the enemy of souls does to try to stop this, God's people will move like a conquering army. We will go forward through this land preaching this gospel. Individuals will hear this message, and they will begin to come out of Babylon, as the message says, come out of her, my people. They will come out in droves, which in turn will infuriate the enemy of souls. It will infuriate the king of the north. It will also infuriate who is behind him or the power behind him, which the Bible says is the dragon, primarily Revelation chapter 12, the dragon, that old serpent called who? The devil, the serpent, Satan. Um, secondarily, of course, Revelation 13, that dragon that gave that sea beast his power was Rome, pagan Rome. When um, the emperor of Rome vacated the eastern, excuse me, the western empire and moved it to Constantinople, uh, it left a void. That void was filled with the bishop of, with the bishop of Rome. So indeed, as the Bible says, that power gave its seat and its great authority to that sea beast of Revelations chapter 13. What I'm trying to tell us today is that this plan is working to a T for the enemy. We have allowed him through all types of distractions, from women ordination to you name it. We, we, we have taken our eyes off the ball, and we have allowed our political positions to dictate of many of our movements. Uh, I have to say this. Personally, I, am, I try to be as apolitical as possible. Uh, I can't even vote, really. I'm a convicted felon. The right to vote has been taken from me. So I don't have that right uh, as some of us do. So I am not a Democrat. I am not a Republican. If I had the right to vote, at best, I would probably be an independent. I am not either one of these. Yet. Some of the things that have been said um, have um, placed me in a camp that I have never been in, that I'm not in, and it has to do with this movement uh, that we see called Black Lives Matter. I have never told anyone to march in a Black Lives Matter protest. What I did tell people is, you have a God in heaven. Ask him what you should do as far as dealing with social justice issues. I have, to, I have to say this, though. Our church was founded on social justice issues. Our church was founded in 1860, 1863. Slavery had not yet been abolished. Okay, Many of the individuals that listened to the preaching of William Miller, um, William Garrison, uh, the editor of the, or the owner of the editor of the paper called The Liberator, was an ab ab abolitionist. William Miller was an abolitionist. Joseph Bates was an abolitionist. Many of the individuals that joined the first movement of the Seventh-day Adventist Church were abolitionists. They were vehemently against a social issue called slavery. So for anyone to think that the church is being drugged into social issues, I disagree. Jesus made it clear in Matthew 25, those things that he talks about, they're all social issues. If you think the church is not to be involved in these things, then take Isaiah chapter 58 out of the Bible. Remove it from the Bible. God had much to say. Many individuals have tried to use uh, page 509 of the Desire of Ages to say that, you know, we shouldn't be involved in these things. I beg to differ. Now, if, if anyone asks me, what do you think about Black Lives Matter? I say, I believe so. I'm black. You know, for me to think that Black lives don't matter as a fact, not as a movement. And why I say this is this, this reason is why I say this is because there are many issues of this Black Lives Matter that I cannot, as a Christian, get behind. I cannot get behind. There are some people that are within that movement that are, have 
different lifestyles and things that I believe are, you know, that are, that are um, opposed to the Christian lifestyle. So I cannot get behind every aspect of that movement. But the social issues, I most certainly believe in. I believe in justice. I believe in righteousness. I believe in fairness. And if you as a Christian don't believe in those things, I would have an issue with why? Why? So for me to um, deny Black Lives Matter would be the same as any other race denying that their particular race doesn't matter. It's, it's ludicrous. But don't get it twisted. I am not supporting in any way many of the issues that some individuals associated with that movement are behind. I hope that that is clear. I don't want to have to speak about it again. So if you want to stop the text and the letters and the, some of the things that, that, that have been coming to me, feel free to do so. Okay? So <clears throat> the reason I am saying this today is because the king of the north, the Bible makes it clear in Revelation, uh, excuse me, Daniel chapter 11, what his plan is to plant his tabernacle between the seas and the holy, glorious mountain. Globally, there will be an attack upon God's people. Zion is that holy, glorious mountain. The people of God are going to be under attack relentlessly. Revelations makes that clear. Daniel 12 makes that clear. Daniel chapter 11 makes it clear. We will become the scum of the earth. earth. We will be the, the thing that, that causes the enemy to turn with fury upon us when he hears the tidings, the Sabbath message, as we begin to tell people about the biblical Sabbath, that it has never been changed. It is a sign between God and his people. In Exodus chapter 31, verse 13, I have given you my Sabbath as a sign that I am the Lord thy God that sanctifies you. As this message swells into a loud cry, and people are hearing, come out of her, my people. God has people that are in Babylon. And I have to say this. If you relegate the term Babylon to simply being a denomination, you may find yourself being deceived. Because there are people that are in other denominations that love God as much as you and I do. They have not yet heard this wonderful message, but they will hear this message. They will come out. Their family ties, everything that has held them thus far will be thrown off. And they will come out and they will join the remnant church. There are people that are in the Seventh-day Adventist church who, when things begin to get difficult, will leave the Seventh-day Adventist church and join the ranks of those who oppose the Sabbath and many of the doctrines that we believe. I have to read this one thing to you. Because this here sent chills up my spine. This is, let's see here, from, well, let me see. I'll find it this way. This is from Review and Herald, March the 18th. It's going to take me just a minute. But what it is, I'll start to tell you what it says. It says that the Lord has a controversy perversy, with his professed people. Let's see. I'm just praying that this thing will not shut off on me. It hasn't as of yet. Are you ready? In fact, I want to read just more than this last part uh, because it's so important to us right now. It says here, we need Nehemiah's who shall arouse the people to see how far they are from God through their transgressions. It is time for the whole Christian world to search the scriptures for themselves. For in the pulpit, all through our land, the law of God is made void by precept and example. The papal power, the king of the north, 
has sought to change the law of God by instituting a Sabbath for the world and the Christian church. And this spurious Sabbath is exalted and revered while the Sabbath of Jehovah is trampled beneath the unholy feet. But will the Lord degrade his law to meet the standard of men? Will he accept a man-made institution in place of the Sabbath which he has sanctified and blessed? No. The convenience or profit of men is not to supersede the claims of God, for he is a jealous God. He does not alter his precepts to gratify the desires of the ambitious or the covetous. Thus saith the Lord should be sufficient to settle all controversy. He who has instituted the Sabbath has never changed it to a common day. He rested on a definite day and blessed and sanctified a definite day. And he requires the human family to observe that definite day. Every part of God's plan will be perfectly executed. Satan has interfered and attempted to thwart it. But there is no change in the law of God. The position that God blessed and sanctified a seventh part of, the, of time, and no day in particular, is one of Satan's devices. By this means, he has so confused the minds of many that they regard God's holy rest day as possessing no special sacredness. And because the world do, world do so, they feel at liberty to set it aside and, and select a Sabbath that suits their own convenience. A professed minister of the gospel assured their congregation that this course is right. Those who are conscientiously observing the original Sabbath are styled heretics, deluded, fanatics, but who are thus regarded in God's sight. But who are thus regarded in God's sight? Whom will he rebuke and punish? Those who have kept the day that he blessed and sanctioned, or those who, have tramp who are trampling upon the holy commandment that the holy commandment have accepted the institute of the papacy? There is need of a Sabbath reform among us. Who profess to observe among us? Who profess to observe God's holy rest? Some discuss their business matters and lay plans on the Sabbath, and God looks upon this in the same light as though they engaged in the actual transaction of business. Others who are well acquainted with the Bible evidence that the seventh day is the Sabbath enter into partnership with men who have no respect for God's holy day. A Sabbath keeper cannot allow men in his employ paid by his money to work on the Sabbath. If for the sake of, of gain, he allows the business in which he has an interest to be carried on on the Sabbath by his unbelieving partner, he is equally guilty with the unbeliever. And it is his duty to dissolve the relationship, however much he may lose by doing so. Men may think they cannot afford to obey God, but they cannot afford to disobey him. Those who are careless in their observance of the Sabbath will suffer great loss. This is what I want you to hear. The Lord has a controversy with his professed people in these last days. In this controversy, men in responsible positions, this is extremely important. This is just not regular lay people. We're told men in responsible positions will take a course directly opposite to that pursued by Nehemiah. They will not only ignore and despise the Sabbath themselves, but they will try to keep it from others by burying it beneath the rubbish of custom and tradition. In churches and in large gatherings, what do we call large gatherings? Camp meetings? Is that what we call them? In, open, in the open air, ministers will urge upon the people the necessity of keeping the first day of the week. There are calamities on sea and land, and these calamities will increase one disaster following close upon another, and the little band of conscientious Sabbath keepers will be pointed out as the ones who are bringing the wrath of God upon the world by their disregard of Sunday. Satan urges this falsehood that he may take the world captive. Back to Daniel chapter 11, verse 45. He wants to plant his tabernacle between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, God's people. He is using politics and whatever means he can to stir up strife and division, and unfortunately, we have led him. We have led him. And it needs to stop. It needs to stop today. It needs to stop now before it's too late. Because his plan is to sit. I've read many scriptures. His plan is to sit 
on the sides of the north to sit in the midst of God's congregation in God's very own church. And he has had some success. And unless we join ourselves and unite ourselves in Christian love and unity, many of us will end in a place that we would not want to be. So this is not something that is to be taken lightly. This individual has real skin in the game, and he will not stop. He will not stop. What I said before was, this nation has been speaking on the civil side as a dragon almost from its founding. And it will turn and begin to speak as a dragon on the religious side. And those who have not stood up against the speak, the dragon speak on the civil side, well, I won't have to say that you will be pretty much deceived on the, on, when he speaks on the religious side. You already are. If you have placed more faith in your political parties, you need to understand God says, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. He could have easily said, not by might or political party but by my spirit, saith the Lord. So we need to understand this is a serious matter, and we need to drop all the bickering, all the arguing, all the name-calling, all the things that most certainly are not Christian, and unite ourselves behind the banner of Jesus Christ and the truth as it is in Christ Jesus. Only those who will be recipients of his latter reign will be the Moab, the, the excuse me, the Edom, the Moab, the chief of Ammon, that will escape. Did you see that in, in Daniel, in those verses there, of, the latter verses of Daniel chapter 11? Some will escape. Some will escape. But it will only be those who have thrown off the shackles of this deception of right and left and understand that it's about north and south. The king of the north wants to plant his self. By the way, the Bible says in John chapter 1, the word became flesh and dwelt. Some of your Bibles say tabernacled. It says tabernacled. Plant your tent. Do you understand? Do you see the similarity between what this king of the north wants to do with his tabernacling or planting his tent or dwelling in the midst of the seas and the glorious holy mountain? Everything that God does, Satan wants to counterfeit and do. He doesn't have a, 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 a really an original thought in his head. The only thing that he has originally come up with is sin. That's it. Everything else he simply takes and repackages, counterfeits, and tries to sell it to people who are gullible and who will listen. Today I'm asking you, study as if you have never studied before the book of Daniel, the book of Revelation, and understand God has a message for the whole world to hear. The three angels' messages. And once we begin to get on that page with the power of the latter rain, and I, by the way, the Bible says in the book James, in the book of James, you have not because you ask not. If you are not asking God each morning when you get up and you have your devotion, Lord, fill me afresh with your spirit. Baptize me afresh with your spirit. If you are too busy to get to your job or to get to whatever it is that you do, that you cannot take the time to get that unction of the Holy Spirit, you are running on your own power and it will run out. It will run out. So I'm asking you, I'm begging you, I am pleading with you, recommit yourself to Christ as you have never done before. We have been told this is perilous times we're living in. This pandemic is only the beginning of sorrows. Things are going to get worse. They're not go we're not going back to normal. And if it seemed that we were going back to normal, I would even be more nervous because when they say peace and safety, then shall destruction break forth on them as a woman in labor. We have to have a new normal now. But that new normal for us has to include us rededicating, recommitting ourselves to Christ in a way that we have never done before. Because you are the stakes. You are what the king of the north is after. It is not accidental that now from the aspect of the good of the common good that an individual is promoting Sunday keeping in order to combat climate change. For years, it was from the religious standpoint, but now things have changed, things have shifted, and now it's simply for the good of the planet. Los Angeles has some of the best air ever now in the whole world because now we have been locked down and cars are not polluting the, 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 the landscape as they used to. Even evangelicals, and this is what amazes me, 
Seventh-day Adventists have begun to speak just like some evangelicals and have saying the same thing, and I, I wonder why. Do you not know that the Bible says that the ba Babylon the Great has daughters? She is the mother of harlots. Do you not know that individuals that rejected that message that came in 1844, the summer of 1844, then turned into a message that said Babylon has fallen? It is going to be reiterated in Revelation chapter 18. Another angel ascends. From the Bible, the north, or in heaven, I should say, the north is up. Another angel comes down. That's one of the tidings also that will cause this king of the north to be furious. This message of this loud cry, come out of her, my people. Come out of her, that you be not partakers of her sins and that you receive not of her plagues. The 16th chapter of Revelation talks about the seven last plagues and God is pleading with his people, come out of her. And as this swells and makes a loud cry, it will infuriate the king of the north. And who is really behind the king of the north? The one who wants to sit in the side of the north. The one who originally says, I will sit in the side of the north. I will ascend above the stars of God. I will be like the most high. You know who that is. I pray that we will listen and act accordingly. Please pray with me. Gracious Father, Lord, I pray that this has been made clear. I pray, Lord, that individuals will not turn away. I'm not speaking of people within the Catholic Church, Lord. I'm speaking of the system, a system that masquerades as Christian that is not. Lord, I pray for those people within that system. I even pray for the individual that is at the head of that system, that somehow maybe his heart will be changed, that he will turn from the course that he is on. Lord, please help us, because we cannot help ourselves. In Jesus' precious name, I do pray. You know, I forgot to say something. Um, and just give me a few minutes to say this. In 1960, for the first time, the United States elected a Catholic individual by the name of John F. Kennedy as president. The first congressional session in 1789, 91% of the Congress at that time, which wasn't nowhere near as big as it is now, was Protestant. Right now today, 31% of the Congress is Catholic. Two thirds of the Supreme Court is Catholic. So understand this, that wound that was delivered to the papacy in 1798, the time of the end, is almost completely healed. It would, will heal. And the very things that history that was before, or excuse me, that was before during the 1,260 years or papal supremacy will be repeated, except you, I, will be the object of scorn. We will be the ones. I said the name of this, the title of this sermon was Signed, Sealed, Delivered. The song that Mr. Wonder wrote had a, one other phrase at the end of that, I'm yours. And this is the lyrics that he said. Spent a, uh, I spent a lot of time doing things that I, I can't even think of the lyrics right now, but I, what I'm saying to you is this. Jesus Christ, by his own blood, signed the emancipation papers of the whole human race. And he has sent the Holy Spirit, who is the sealer, not the seal. The seal of the living God received in the forehead is the seventh day Sabbath. Signed by the emancipation papers of his own blood, Christ has sealed his people and is sealing his people. And Daniel chapter 12 says he will deliver his people. Sister, would you do me one favor? Read Psalms, because I'm afraid this thing may not turn back on. Psalms chapter 50, verse 15. I'll see if they'll turn back. Oh, it did turn back on. Remember, signed, sealed, delivered. God will deliver his people. In Psalms chapter 50, I said. Yes. Yeah, I got it. Psalms chapter 50 and verse 15. The Lord says to us, and call upon me in the day of trouble. 
I will what? Sister? I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. Amen. Signed, sealed, delivered. And 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 19 says, we have this to the seal, his seal. God knows them that are his. So the last portion of that song by Mr. Wonder says, I'm yours. We can say to Lord Jesus, I am yours. I'm yours. Have thine own way. Thank you.